Right. What are they? I'm not going to worry. Uh, Actually, can you see me? I can. I, I can, can see you. Yeah. yeah. Hang on. One second. Um, it's preparing. And it's redirecting to a live Facebook page. I have no idea. That's okay. Now that I know where it is, live on Facebook. Let's see. It will pop up here in a second. And then we want to admit George Wilson at probably. Okay. Can you see me, Josh? I can see you. Can you see me now? No, I can't see anyone. All right. Now I can. Go. Cool. There we are. All right. Here we are. There's that Facebook. And we're going to go ahead and start sharing this now. Hang on one second. Uh, share this. Sure. You're doing it from your page, right? I mean, it's just, we got to skin this cat, man. Here we go. Here we go. There you go. All right. George is waiting. Let's go ahead and bring him in and I'll finish working out the kinks on, on my side while you get started. Mm -hmm. Ready? You see me? I can see you loud and clear. I can hear you loud and clear too. Awesome. Yeah. We welcome in George Wilson. He's fabulous. Hey there. Hey, how y'all doing this evening? Good. How are you? Well, how are you doing, doing man? Well, doing well. Good to uh, be with y'all today. George Wilson. George Wilson. Amen. <laughs> Travis Moore meet George Wilson. Tasha Dukes meet George Wilson. I'm, I'm, I'm formally meeting you, Brent. Hey, yeah. Yeah, it's the way we got to meet each other during these times, you know. Honestly. We got to adapt to the circumstances. But we're so. working with it. Absolutely. We're working Absolutely. with it. So it's good. It's all good. So <laughs> welcome to This Matter Matters. Hey, I, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. You know, I like what you guys are doing, and I'm excited about uh, the conversation we're going to be having today. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. And, and and also you are talent at Maryland's agency, so that's a that's a plus for us. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We all family. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's the third cousin. Now second. Now first. <laughs> 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 so you know, um, I know Rhonda has shared with you. We love. First of all, we love Rhonda. Okay, let's just start with that. Good people. Great she, people. She she jumped in, and from the moment. Uh, like the first moment of phone call, Rhonda was a family. She was sister. She was, it, she, I just, I mean, she loves what she does. It shows. And we appreciate her so much for introducing a lot of different topics to us, but you're, you have some specific things that you, that you do. And of course, you know, I'm sure she shared with you um, the things that we discuss um, regarding, um, you know, the racial inequality. I hate to keep saying that. Like, we've said that so many weeks at a time. Yeah. But we continuously talk about the inequalities and the inequity and justice with the, what's going on in today's climate. But before we get into that, we want to, you know, first give our audience a good introduction to George Wilson. So, uh, 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 Travis, I'll let you start with that illustrious uh, bio and <laughs> <laughs> career, career, yes, we Ooh. love it. I, I don't mind doing that at all. You know, George, uh, I was reading through some of your um, your, your past uh, victories, and um, I, I, I'm gonna tell you what touched me the most. Um, 
um, all of it was great, but it was the farming. It was really the farming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously, um, we, we might, really might be related because we're born in the same year, but uh, 1981, uh, former uh, American football safety, he was signed by the Detroit Lions as an undrafted free agent in 2004. He played college football at Arkansas. Uh, Wilson was a long time player for the Buffalo Bills and also played for the Tennessee Titans. And that's, um, that's just on the NFL um, screen. Obviously, he's done much with his, um, his philanthropy. He's also done um, a lot through farming. He gives back to the community. Um, it seems like daily. I don't know if it's daily, but it seems like much. And um, yeah. the thing that touches me more than anything um, is you give back to the youth. You know, you help Absolutely. with development. So yeah. um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our brother, our friend, our family, George Wilson. And if there's anything else I missed, please state it. Please state it. <laughs> oh, no, no, that was, that was a good, uh, that was a good synopsis of, uh, you know, my past and everything. Uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, I went to college in Arkansas and, uh, you know, my dreams of playing in the NFL, I was able to continue to pursue those coming out of high school because of my academic excellence in the classroom. And so wow. when I went to Arkansas, I didn't go initially on an athletic scholarship. I attended on an academic scholarship. And that's something that my mom was uh, was very adamant about. You know, she gave us two choices. You either going to college or going to the military. There was nobody staying in the house beyond graduation of high Those school. Were so, the days. Yeah, Those yeah, were the ab- days when mama said she put the law down and then that was it. Right. Uh-uh. No, there was no other alternative. And so just being able to to be book smart and always be conscious that I can use my my talents and skills and abilities to get other things that I want out of life. And, and yeah. I just had the mindset that I was not gonna allow football to use me without getting something in return. And that's an education, that's a platform, yeah. that's a net, network of resources and contacts. And just to be able to have a voice, to be able to connect people and to be able to, uh, to serve my community that I, that I work in, that I live in. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's always been my mindset. Awesome, yeah. awesome. So. Uh, you know what, we, th- that's what we see when we look at your, your bio and your history. We see what your mother instilled in you, mm-hmm. that you're gonna take this one piece, but you're going to grow this into some things and this will make you the man that you are today. And so we say, I'm a mother of four sons. So I get mom's, uh, her, her statement, her flat right. line, this is what it's gonna be. And this is how, I know what's best. This is what you're gonna do. You're not gonna sit here and do anything. So that is that is why I'm sure this has led you into so many areas that I've read about concerning children and giving back to the community in those ways. But first I wanna start uh, just kind of ticking down the list a little at a time. You can't wait around for an hour, but right. we want to, to give a little bit of attention to each one of these things. Like for instance, I had a lot of people ask me about being an undrafted, ask him about being an undrafted free agent with the Detroit Lions. So I I don't, tell me why that's, now I had my son plays football for A&T. So I'm a football mom because of that. So tell me, tell me why that's huge for people to to know. What what is it that they want to know about that? Well, the thing about the, the NFL and the draft, everybody pays attention to the draft. Um, you know, because those are the, 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 the marquee guys. Those are the guys mm-hmm. that initially get, you know, large sums of upfront money, mm-hmm. um, you know. And so to be an undrafted guy is kind of like if you're working a, in a, a large corporation, being an undrafted guy is probably equivalent to, to working in the basement in the mail room. You know, okay. you're, at the very, you're at the very bottom of the totem pole, you know, and you got to scratch and claw and fight for every opportunity. And those opportunities are, are far and few. In between, and so you have to make the most of them. And so, uh, but the thing about being an undrafted uh, rookie free agent, um, I was already, I was already prepared for that because in college I went on an academic scholarship and I walked on the football team. Got you. I saw. I read that. I read that. So so being a walk on in college, being a non scholarship athlete in college, is essentially the same thing as being an undrafted rookie free agent in the NFL. And so I already walked that walk. I already lived that life. So you were prepared. Yes, absolutely. I was fully prepared of the work that 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 lied ahead. uh, You know, laid ahead of me. You know, when I got there, and so. Uh, but my background, uh, as you guys mentioned in farming, 
Um, I grew up working in tobacco fields when I wasn't in school or, or playing wow. sports. And so hard work was never foreign to me. It's been oh in my God. bloodline. It's been in my DNA, you know, since I've been able to, to walk and, and carry a shovel or hold the water hose, you know. And so when I got to college as a walk on and when I got to the NFL as a rookie, you know, undrafted rookie free agent, I just knew I just had to keep working like I've always done. Oh, there was no, I was never going to allow any of my peers to outwork me or work yeah. longer than me or harder than me. That was just my mentality. You know, I'm a blue collar guy. I'm not, I'm not a guy that, that, uh, that, that likes to be seen or heard. I like to let my work stand for me and speak for me. And so that was always my approach and, and from being able to, to create opportunities and take advantage of the opportunities that I had, um, you know, I earned the respect of my peers in the locker room. And so they saw my journey, they saw yeah. my fight. And so as I was able to, to make the roster and actually uh, begin to, to get, you know, dressing out on game day and eventually yeah. playing, you know, I had to, to scratch and claw and just take advantage of every, every opportunity I had. I know I keep talking about opportunity, but opportunity oftentimes in life is disguised as hard work. Listen, and a lot of people that we it don't led you somewhere. <laughs> yes. Your opportunity led you somewhere to being George. signed is where it led you. George, you said opportunity is what? Say it again. Disguise. It's often disguised as hard work. Wow. You know, That's and, a statement. And, and, yeah. And, and so like for me, I'm like, this is the opportunity that I've been waiting for. And so it maybe it didn't come the way that I dreamed it. You know, when I was growing up, but at the end of the day, I still have an opportunity to pursue my dream. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, you know, just bring your lunch pail and your hard hat, take advantage of every day, try to get better at something every day. And I, I know it's kind of trivial and it's kind of cliche, but you know, that was my mentality. One day at a time, don't focus on what happened yesterday, stay in the moment, control what you can control. And so those those were some of the the the, uh, the attributes and mindsets that I had, you know, with being that undrafted guy because it's not easy, you know. No. Those opportunities, you know, if I'm an undrafted guy, you know, if we get reps in practice, okay, a draft pick just to kind of show you a draft pick, a first round draft pick. Most of the time, if you run in a two two to three hour practice, that draft pick has probably gotten maybe you know forty to fifty reps, maybe. Mm -hmm. As an undrafted guy. I, I might have gotten 10 reps. Uh, you see what okay. I'm saying? So okay. like the opportunities are not the same. And yeah. so it, it's imperative that we, that as an undrafted Ricky free agent, that you take advantage of every opportunity. If they need somebody, jump out there. Even if it's not your position, it just shows the attitude and a willingness to do whatever it takes yeah. to be able to get out there on the field. And that's what you have to be able to do when you're pursuing your dreams, you got to be willing to do whatever you have to do in order yeah. to see your dreams come true. Because it's not going to be easy. It's no. not. If it's going to be easy, if everybody would be able to do it. And right. if it came easy, you wouldn't value it when you did get it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that so so now that we know that opportunity is many times disguised right. as hard work, right. note that you worked really hard as a... Um, a undrafted free agent that that worked you right on into signing with the Buffalo Bills. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. When I when I first got there, you know, uh, I had some great great uh, veteran guys that showed me, you know, what being a pro means. You know, uh, in, the, in the NFL, you know, you hear the term, you hear the phrase, you know, be a pro, be a pro. That means do what you're supposed to do, even when nobody's telling you what to do. Yeah. You know, and so just following, you know, veteran guys, you know, I had some great guys. I played with uh, London Fletcher and Takeo Spikes and Troy Vinson and Lawyer Malloy. And I mean, I could go on and on, but I just played with some really good guys, some quality men off the field and some exceptional athletes on the field. Wow. And so, you know, just to be able to have those type of mentors and those examples really showed me you know, what it was that I needed to do in order to have, you know, a, a, a long career in the NFL. Wow. Yeah, I, listen, I, I'm, I'm looking at all of, all of your, um, your, your bio and your history. So from the Buffalo Bills, I mean, in this whole starting off as the undrafted, I guess that's why everybody kind of wanted to know. I mean, I got so many questions about that. But from there, though, as you said, this, this disguised opportunity led you to the Buffalo Bills and then on to the Tennessee Titans. 
Yes, yes, yeah. So I, I, I was in Buffalo for about uh, eight and a half seasons and was able to finish my career, you know, um, my last two years in Tennessee, you know, in Nashville, which happens to be, you know, uh, less than two hours from my hometown. So it's yeah. kind of like a dream come true. You know, right. Kentucky, Kentucky, where I'm from, doesn't have a pro team. And so Nashville is the closest NFL team. And so I was able to see my family more often. I was oh, able nice. to spend holidays with my family. So yeah. like, you know, when I was in Buffalo, you know, um, I didn't get to go come home for Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, I was working. And so between college and, and the NFL, you know, I did not get a chance to go home for Christmas, I think for about 15 years before I was able to spend Christmas with my family. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's a sacrifice that I had to make. And so to be able to come back home, uh, we're close to home in Nashville with the Titans for my last two seasons was just like a dream come true to be able to see my mom and my family, uh, you know, week in and week out when we played at home in Nashville. So like that was just a huge blessing. Yes. And, and a huge opportunity for me to bring more kids from my hometown to be able to see me play, wow. you know, and, and just to be able to, to like I said, to experience, interact with more of my family, you know, uh, on game day. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, George, um, you know, obviously I, I hear family in, in your uh, tone is, is part of your foundation. It's part of your makeup, which I really respect. Um, much, much similar to mine. And um, a lot of what Tasha has explained to me and expressed to me as well. Um, so as a professional, uh, when you when you obviously were on the field, um, you had to gain the respect and respect and garner the respect of others. And then as well off the field, you you spoke of integrity, you know, um, in so many ways. So let's let's switch gears if you don't mind, um, but still along these same lines. Um, when you saw Kaepernick take a knee, how did that affect you? I was glad that somebody that somebody finally did it. You know, wow. um, you know, it was right there. I think he started doing it right at, toward the end of my last year. Uh, it was when all the, a lot of the protests started happening and he really, you know, uh, did it for the entire 2015 season. And so uh, I was proud of him. Um, if I had played that 2015 season, there's a very strong possibility, a good chance that I would have been taking yeah, the knee. Yeah, and, 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 and it's not an easy decision because, you know, um, Unfortunately, if you haven't experienced these things, you won't understand them oftentimes. And so he was faced with a lot of criticism because yeah, people were not listening to what he said and they were listening to all the commentary uh, about what he was doing and not listening to what he said. And I just find it, you know, um, you know, too ironic that we've come to this point to now the commissioner of the NFL and the mm -hmm. NFL as an as a institution has essentially apologized for, for not taking him at his word, oh, you know? And, that, and, that, and, and unfortunately, he, he lost his career because of that. He was blackballed, you know, out of the NFL because he took a stance on human rights. Rights, human rights. He took a stand on human rights. Human rights. And so, Honestly. you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's sad that so many more lives were lost so many more families were impacted, mm -hmm. um, you know, by more of these things to, taking place. Yeah. You know, that was a five year gap between where we are now. You know, and back then those, those protests in the streets were largely black and brown people. But yeah. now you, you see a rainbow coalition of, of, of races and genders and, 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 and age you know, in, in these streets protesting because they see now that everybody is impacted by this. Dr. King said that, you know, about injustice anywhere is a, a threat to justice everywhere. And right. so right. now the, the protests in the streets are a reflection of that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Um, so that leads me to my, because I thought about that when we were just sort of cashing out the things that we wanted to discuss with you was just, where's your headset when it comes to this whole thing with Kaepernick? And he's sort of being a catalyst in the NFL, having lost it all. He did, he lost, he lost it all. Now, I'm not sure where he is positioned today with his career. I know that there are some opportunities that came along. They were not the best fit for him. That is his choice totally. But because he took a stand, he had to continue to take that stand. He couldn't backtrack. So for that, he is, um, you know, he, he's a hero. 
and he's you know what i mean yeah absolutely he he, he will go down in history with the other um athlete icons as i call them you know your yeah. kareem your kareem abdul jabbar your bill russell your Jim uh -huh. Brown, yeah you know muhammad ali like we can go on and on he yeah. will be he will be mentioned with the greats he's the that, that, history. absolutely because of his sacrifice you know he who knows if he would have that same stature if he was able to continue to play but because of what he was willing to put on the line what he was willing to lose what he was willing to sacrifice like you said is what put him on that stage on that yeah. platform yeah. and so it, it it is um it, it it's a it's a great thing that 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 uh, the nfl has apologized to him you know after the fact doesn't doesn't make it right doesn't doesn't you know change history but at the end of the day the nfl was at least uh humble enough to, to apologize and to be able to put money behind their, their words to yeah. be able to support some of the social just justice uh, challenges that, that our country is currently facing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk about, um, you know, you, you talked about money. Let's talk about some of the injustices that we're facing today. Uh, most recent, this week, we, we heard well, about- wait, Travis, before you get into that, I got a hot, 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 hot. This thing is hot. <laughs> I want to know what your thoughts are. All now, you know who just became the coach at Jackson State. What's your thoughts oh, yeah. about that? Man, it's great. It's, <laughs> it's great. It's great for, for, for black colleges and universities. Uh, I think it's going to do uh, wonders for the Jackson State uh, recruiting. The city of Jackson. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Dion in them, it, by himself alone is going to bring a crowd and is going to bring attention. And so we know that the spotlight is going to be on them. Yeah. Um, if, if, if anybody, you know, knows crime and has followed his career, he doesn't have do anything. He gives all of himself. He has fun doing it. He exhibits passion uh, when, he, when, he, when he talks and when he does something. And so I know that enthusiasm is going to become infectious around that program. And I would not be surprised if you start to see some of your, you know, uh, highly um, touted, uh, you know, high school seniors signing with Jackson State instead of, instead of some of your large universe, traditional universities. Because at the it end of the day, guys, touched. got you know, if, if you are a, an athlete that aspires to play at the highest level, no matter where, you, what it is, in NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, whatever, the best way to, to, to give yourself, you know, the best chance to, to, to see those dreams come true uh -huh. is to work with somebody who's already been a where you're trying to get to. And so like, that's what you have with, with, with Prime. I think, and I haven't seen what the rest of his coaching staff looks like, but I know he's going to surround himself with other quality, you know, athletes or former athletes and, uh, and coaches, and they're going to do the best they can to be able to, you know, yeah. put that, to put that, that institution on the map in college football. Hmm. Absolutely. I, so that's what I, I, I just thought, um, I, I worked in Jackson, uh, Mississippi. It's probably been since 2016 now, um, just doing some work with the agency and so forth and so on. And it, it sort of grew into other business and, and all of that. But I saw Jackson as a metropolis back then. And I thought this town is waiting for, it's like waiting for the right thing to hit and it will it, it's ready whenever it comes and then when I saw I heard about this announcement and then I saw the press conference and all of this I was like this is huge this is it's huge. big time yeah it's big absolutely time. absolutely I mean big I think time son, time. <laughs> yeah I think his son is a high, uh, highly talented recruit he's very think, much so and I think he, he's even considering going to play with his dad down there and so I mean, all you need is one guy yeah, and then and then and then it'll be a domino effect, you know. And that's one big name guy to sign there, or one athlete to come out of there and go to the NFL. Yeah, and then you'll have you'll have more guys coming to follow in their steps, and so you know they've done they've done the first part in getting a, a quality a quality individual in there to yeah. lead their program that 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 is respected by the by his peers, and uh, I think he'll be earned the respect of that community and and that um, that a uh, fan base. I think he's going to, I think it's going to be huge. And I think it's going to be a major success to the whole city of Jackson. Uh, Jackson state is just, um, you know, they, they're, they're the recipients of gold right now. And it's just going to spread to the, 
to the whole city. And the city's going to be that much greater for it. I hope he's there a long time. Absolutely. So a lot of success. I know the city's going to see a lot of success as a result of that. All right, Travis, that was my hot thing. I, <laughs> football, football, that's my little football token right there. Yeah, I, 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 that. that was nasty. Let's, let's, talk, let's switch gears. Uh, still on the same page, though. Um, um, we'll, we're on gear number two. Let's go to gear three. Um, <laughs> Brianna Taylor, what are your thoughts concerning the, the, the charges, you know, the money that was uh, supposedly given to the family? What are your thoughts? Um, obviously, it's taken, and I don't want to sway you in any way because um, you're your own man, but it has taken some time, and now we hear this. We hear what's going on and where we are at this point in time. There's a lot of still unrest. So what yeah. are Man, yesterday, um, yesterday was heavy. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I'm from Kentucky. Uh, I have family that live in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, all the time that's gone by, you know, since this happened back in in March, I believe, and there was no um, there was no clear direction as far as the investigation goes. There was not a whole bunch of communication with the public about you know, the state of the investigation, how yeah. they were going to go about it. That's and a we good know point you're to, making, the clear direction. That was right. missed. Yeah, that like, was missed. Like, 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 if you want people to respect the, the legal system and to uh, believe, you know, the things that are, are being spoken from, from, that, from that microphone and from that platform, you got to level with the people. Yeah. You know, and, and we were not given that. And so to have all these months go by and then you step in front of that microphone yesterday and you're essentially talking to us as if we can't see what's really happening. Right, right. There were no charges related to what happened to Breonna Taylor. The only charges came from an apartment that was next to it that was filled by a white family. Now, why... Okay, well, why weren't any charged? So no bullets hit any other apartments with black families or black people in them? I, I believe from what I, I have saw and what I've read, it was, but those were not included. Mm -hmm. Her name was not even in the indictment. Right. No. We've been saying, say her name for months, and they and couldn't they even do that. They refused. They couldn't even do that. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and so, like, you just look at everything that led up to yesterday. You know, whether it's the state of emergency that was declared in the city of Louisville before the decision was rendered, you wouldn't declare a state of emergency if you were going to actually charge these officers. So you tipped your hand. You tipped your you hand. Know? I, you know what? I, I spoke about this last week and I felt like uh, I felt like there was a few things that was um, let out in the media last week and the week before regarding the finances and the monies and things like that. It's just certain things that I look at and I sort of see a pattern going on. And when that happens, this is what it actually means. Right. A absolutely. I mean, you look at the, yeah. And so after the state of emergency was declared, then the city settles with the family in the civil suit. And so, you know, the city to some, to some degree is accepting fault or, or responsibility well, that's for, all for, my for, for what happened. Who, why do you, why do you pay when it, you didn't do anything wrong? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's the easy question. But anybody in corporate America I tell you sometimes you just pay to make it go away. And I think that's essentially what they were hoping to do to okay. try to quell some of the some of the the, um, you know, some of the pushback from the from the public yeah. and, and to try to also try to quell some of the, 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 you know, the things that are simmering on the surface. People were on edge because they, you know, we had got no knowledge, you know, it was released that a decision was 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 uh, was coming. Yeah. And so I think you you know you do that you do that settlement in an effort to try to you know soften the blow. Uh -huh. You know you know because you know you got some people that are protesting before that now that they've gotten money now it's like well you know it's not the same as having her back but hey you got twelve million dollars so hey you know what can you say? That's what, what you I say said. exactly, so, and so like is money, not justice. right? Money does not change the fact that these officers are not being held accountable when these type of things are, you know, are happening. Yeah. Like, like, come on, it's not, it's obviously not working when maybe one percent 
of instances where a police officer is in, in, in you know, has shot, shot a black, a black, black man or woman, less than 1% of them yeah. are, are convicted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like these, these are facts. These are facts. facts. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, like if you are hearing these things and you are hearing our people cry out for equality, mm -hmm. we not even want revenge. We just want what's, what's, what's our just due. Listen. As the rest of the citizens, we're not even asking for anything more than anybody else has gotten. Mm -hmm. What we're asking for is very realistic, but, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get that until the people in power are held to account for their inaction. Yeah. And that's what that's what's on the ballot on November the 3rd. Yeah, we, uh, we, yeah. We, we, we have to use our power at the ballot box yeah. to let our voices be heard because this cannot be acceptable. This cannot be, um, this can no, let's let it, this can no longer be the norm in our country if we truly want to be the United States of America. Exactly, exactly. And I said that uh, on last week's show when we talked about Breonna Taylor, this had, this, you know, obviously this verdict, had not come down quite yet, but I kind of, you know, like I said, some things that you hear some things and you kind of know, you see the pattern and here it goes. Yep. Um, and I said last last week um, when we were talking about this subject matter that, you know, many, many times because, because uh, they've ramped up the voting for the president, they've ramped up, you know, the candidacy, the president, the White House, let's get whoever's in out, let's get Let's keep whoever's in, in. You know, all of that has been such a fury of chaos at this point. But I think that it is important to know that when we deal with issues like this, you must vote in your local municipalities. Mm -hmm. You have got to deal with your local city, county, your governor, your mayor, your, all of those things have got to be the, your chief of police. Those things, that's not president. That's right here right. in the house. Right. You yeah. gotta be at that poll in between time. Right. So that yeah. Your voice can be heard in between time because if I don't like what's going on in the house, mm -hmm. forget what's going on in the neighborhood at the rec center. Right. It's what's going on in the house. Right, right, right. That yeah, we, we need gotta... to deal with. So yeah, you know, they need to flood those polls when it's time for local elections. Yeah, absolutely. What you have isn't working. Right, right. It's it's not, it's not, it's not working. I mean, and that, and and that you, goes across the board for the North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. That's that's every state. Right. You see that level of thing, because a lot of times when you see that level of uh, power, we talked about this uh, a week or so ago regarding right. Atlanta's AG. Mm -hmm. We were talking about a, a case with uh, Jamari and Robinson, and I won't say a thing about him because he's just been my little that's been my little heart. I've been carrying that along ever since I heard about that story. And but the AG was found to have uh, done some things there in Atlanta. So we talked about the fact that that's that you you got a lack of integrity that will jump ship to another state. Yes, yes, that's and, what and that's what have. we yeah, and that's what we have. You know, with with uh, with the attorneys, like you said, with the with lawyers and the prosecutors. That's what you have with police officers. You know, they get yeah. complaints, they get let go from one precinct or one department. They relocate to a different state and, and um, you know, get rehired again. And so That's it's awesome. like, it's like, how how is it that that seems to apply to everybody else in public? If I go to work and I got complaints with me on the job, mm -hmm. you know, it's a good chance that if I go apply for another job, they might catch wind of that somehow, some way, right. if, they're, if they're good during their background checks. But how does that not apply to police officers? How can how how can you attorney uh, general? How can you be disciplined numerous times? Right. Uh, One of them was know, 17, throughout your career? Yeah, 17 right. cases against him. Right. Yeah. How can you do that and still keep a job in where you're able to apply deadly force mm -hmm. just based on your word alone? And yep. so that that's the that's the troubling part of how the system is is currently set up. And so if we if we want to see real change, you know, we, we definitely have to, you know, uh, you know, reshape and, 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 and reform the system, you know, yeah. and that's, 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 you know, actually getting on a community local level and seeing what each and every community needs because every community doesn't need the same thing. And that's so, so you can't, 
So right now there's a one size fit all approach to policing across this country. And yeah. every community doesn't require that, that approach. Yeah, uh, we talked about uh, that as well with the, with the local community policing. And, and I think we've had a, a few uh, people in police, uh, the detectives and so forth, Sanford mm -hmm. Davis and, and on and, and Al Clement. Um, and they talked about the, you know, the, there, there is just such a shortage of, of staff, if, if you will so that you don't have the local community policing like you once did where the police uh, came from this community or was sent into a community where he was able to get to know the residents get to understand the residents uh i think sanford davis mentioned you know when you when you begin to embrace those certain communities because they that's where you're going to be every day right. so you you get to know them you, you're policing them but you build a bond with them you understand their fears you understand their likes their dislikes their goals their desires mm -hmm. you see the children from age six going up to 16 and 18 and you're able to pull coattails because you've watched them grow you know the families that they come from that is not uh what when i grew up that were in chicago and i'm from chicago you, we had that but but they were saying to us that now in this dispensation there is a, a shortage of police that are able to be sort of melted into the communities as it once were so now you just have uh, a, a person that might just be answering the call mm -hmm. you know they may come from wherever but because they're available they shift over to a community that they have no knowledge about right. uh, where maybe the guy that was there at least a month he's off that day right you know so he has a, a somewhat of a bond there but this, this new guy just comes from wherever and then he goes over and he executes whatever authority that he feels it deems necessary because he doesn't know the community. And then you just flat out have a bad apple. In the bunch. Right. 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 You just right. flat out have some bad apples. And, and I was listening to, uh, I think it was Chris Rock that said, you know, uh, uh, there are some jobs that bad apples are unacceptable. <laughs> right. Right. He said like right. That. I'm with you. You know, right. like he said, you don't hear American Airlines say, you know, I, most of our pilots, they like to land most of the time. <laughs> right. We got right. a few that don't mind hitting, a, you know, a, a mountain, but most of them. So, you know, we, you're taking your chance, but most of them. So, so it's, it's kind of those things, you know, doctors, they, there's there's not a lot of room for error in certain professions. Right. So so we talked about a lot of that um, with regard to reform, not dismantling the police. That's ridiculous. Right. You know, right I think right. that I think that that just has to be said over and over again. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. We don't need to dismantle them. We just, we just need to reform them and redesign them in a way to make them more effective right. in, in, in what exactly. we need them to do. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and All right, Travis, this is on you. I'm I'm gonna get on my tangent if I don't yeah, you, it go. Look, no, you. You're right. So I, I heard you mention, um, Tasha, you know, the, the children, six to 16 in the neighborhoods. Um, George, I, I deal with children across the globe, um, um, all ages up to 18. And then uh, we surpass that up into college. Um, so it's, it's, it's the mentorship is a big deal for me. Um, so in this climate, con considering you're uh, part of youth development, you, you give back to the community, you know, have a few organizations. I even read where uh, there's something called Rustic Nights in uh, Kentucky. Um, yeah, yeah. That's coming up regarding farming. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do you and how do you deal with the youth uh, in this climate? What are you telling them? How, do, how are you encouraging them? How are you giving them an outlet? And I know that's a loaded question, but um, anywhere you want to start, that's a great start. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely a heavy question, but it's, a, it's really a simple answer when you're dealing with kids, at least in my approach. Okay. And it's, it's just to listen to them. Okay. A lot, a lot of kids feel like they don't have a voice. You know, they in their homes, you know, their opinions don't matter. You know, at the end of the day, mommy, what mom and dad says goes, okay. regardless of how you feel. And so the way I'm able to connect with kids is just letting them know what you, your voice matters. Okay. You yeah. know, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and be on my phone and, 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 and trying to multitask while we talk. I'm going to look you right in your soul. And I'm going to put my arm around you. I'm going to hug you if you need me to, or, you know, give you an objective uh, piece of advice to help you. And so sometimes just people in general, we just need to be heard. Yeah. And sometimes it just feels good just to get it out because we're, 
where we're conditioned to not want to bother other people with our problems yeah. that, that, that we're dealing with inside of our own heads and our, our own minds and bodies. And so, you know, my approach to the kids is first to listen. You know, if I if I listen and I come from a place of under, trying to seek understanding and not judge, they trust me sooner. They trust me quicker. Yeah. And so then they may share something with me that's that's uncomfortable uh, or they would, may not have, uh, you know, felt felt uh, comfortable enough to to share with me if I would have ridiculed them or scold them you know, for what they're sharing with me. And yeah. so I try to just always come from a, a place of trying to seek understanding first. And I try to coach the decision process and not the decision. I try not to make that my, 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 my focus okay. because everybody doesn't have a decision-making process. Right. And that, but they should, right. you know, we shouldn't allow our emotions to dictate our decisions because, you know, it's been said that when emotions are running high, our logic is low. Right. And so it, it's it's important just to be able to get it out of you, you know, so you so you don't have to keep it bottled up. And so when dealing with kids, that's that's my approach, and they they take to me, you know, and 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 I, you know, I'm still you know fairly young enough where I can relate to them. I still listen to some of the same music they do. I right. don't do the dance moves or nothing like that, <laughs> but but you know, just to be able to show them, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I like that T-shirt too. I like I like that song yeah, too. Connect. You know, it shows that we right. We got a connection. Yeah. We got something in common. And so if when you're able to do that, then you're really able to reach a kid. Then you're really able to make 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 progress in their lives and helping them to navigate you know through their youth yeah. right right so i have um you know there's there's a tie there my my grandfather was a um he is a gardener he uh he gave back to the community in that light and i grew up um trying to um uh have a green thumb if you will when it came to uh crops and things of that nature um and now i, I found out that you're a, a black farmer um, and then, uh, of course, that that hits me harder because in my in my group, we we have a, a black farmer and I see oh. it. it. So uh, with that said, um, let's let's discuss agriculture and, and youth and, and why that's a need, why that's a, a, a huge thing, especially at this point in time. And then oh, we yeah. Right into rustic nights, because that's a big OK. Thing. All right. Well, yeah, you know, uh, agriculture, man, it's, it's a it's a wide, you know, industry. You know, but for, for me, for, for farming in particular and raising crops, uh, for me, it's, it's been therapeutic. Okay. It's such an extreme opposite of what I did most of my life, which is on the, on the field, being a gladiator, running into each other, running into other people for a living. And so okay. being out on the farm has been therapeutic for me. Like I'm able to, to, to feel like I'm one with the earth. Y'all yeah. put my hand, I put my hands in the soil and you know, before I got into this, man, any bug I saw I was smashed. You know. <laughs> but but now, but now that I'm a farmer, I'm like, no, don't kill the spider. The spider web catches the mosquitoes. Okay. You know, um, you know, don't don't uh don't don't be scared of the frogs. The frogs are a clear indication that there's not many snakes around because okay. the snakes are their predators. Okay. And so just seeing that everything has a role. Yeah. You know, everything has a role to play. You know, everybody has a role to play. And then on and then on, on top of that, um, it's taught me patience. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I when I you know, you don't just walk out there and, and put a seed in the ground and come back the next day and you got, you know, fruit or you know, produce on the vine. That's not how it goes, you know. And, wow. and so like, you know, you gotta you gotta till the ground, you gotta prepare the ground for the yeah. soil. No different that you got to prepare in real life for future opportunities. You know, you got to prepare the ground to receive that blessing. And so you got to till the ground. You got to plant the seed. You got to oh, fertilize. You felt that thing coming on. I saw it. Yeah, right. you got to. Right. I just saw that. <laughs> Go ahead. You got to. You got to nurture it. You know, you got to. You got to create a condition around that seed that's conducive for growth. Mm. And everything that I'm saying right now applies to people. Because mm -hmm. yeah. at, at the end of the day, it's a process that I got to go through as a gardener, as a farmer. There's a certain process that I got to go through. And if I skip any of those steps, if I eliminate any of those steps, 
then I'm going to compromise the end product. If I get anything at all, right. it's going to be compromised. And it's the same, like I said, it's the same thing in our lives. We got to go, it's got, it's a part of the process. Life is a journey. It's a process. Mm -hmm. And you can't eliminate the steps that you have to go through as we grow to be men and women uh, in our families, in our communities, uh, and, 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 and all throughout our lives. Yeah, and so with, with, being, with being in that agriculture, it just made me feel one, uh, made me really feel a part of the, the universe and, and being a working piece of that. And so with that experience and with that platform, you know, I'm trying to expose more kids to agriculture. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed how many kids don't know where the food that they eat comes from. Mm -hmm. How many kids have never been to a, an actual farm to be able to see a tomato on the vine or a watermelon on the vine? Mm -hmm. You know, these things are, are essential to survival. Right. You know, and so we're trying to teach kids how to survive, mm -hmm. not just with goal achievement or conflict resolution, but also food security, you know, that, that two or $3 pack of seeds, if you, if you plant them and do them the right, treat them the right way and nurture them yeah. can produce, you know, hundreds of dollars of food if you do it the right way. And so way. like, you know, just trying to, to educate our youth and expose them to these opportunities uh, to be able to acquire these same experiences that I had growing up, but also mm -hmm. equipping them with the with the expertise to be able to do this on their own and so if we can teach you know one how to grow they can go and teach two of their peers and yes. they can you know it can go on and and, and multiply yes. you know exponentially and so that's what i'm trying to use my farm to do uh is is uh you know instagram my name is gw the cultivator i came up with this moniker you know before i really started doing this farm stuff really heavy and so, you know, as a cultivator, you know, you, you, you cultivate the land, you know, as a farmer. And yeah. so it's a dual meaning, like, yes, I'm, you know, in the literal sense, I'm cultivating the land, but the other side of the coin is I'm using my farm as a resource and as a platform to cultivate my community. Yeah. And that's, that's, where, that's where my head is with what I'm doing. What I'm doing doesn't, it doesn't bring a lot of money. It doesn't bring a lot of glory, yeah. but it, 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 it it's, it doesn't feel like work to me because I'm, it's a passion of mine. Yeah. And so I'm trying, like I said, I'm trying to expose more people, more youth to, to, to what I'm doing so that they can in turn maybe do that in their own backyards or their right. neighborhoods, you know, because we can't, we can't be dependent on somebody else to feed us. Hmm. You know, cancer is running rampant in our country. Uh, it seems like every every week there's a new study, something you eat or something you drink is causing cancer that they just researched. And so, uh, you know, before all these pharmaceutical companies, you know, popped up all over the world, people healed themselves through their food, through their diet. You know, my grand my grandparents, you know, my my grandmother and my great my, my great grandmother lived to be almost a hundred years old. She lived out on the farm the most the bulk of her life. Wow. So she lived off the land. She drank well water. And so she wasn't dependent on commercial or, uh, uh, you know, food service companies to be able to, to feed her. And so I think that, you know, that generation, but those generations before us was able to live longer lives because mm -hmm. of what they were consuming on a daily basis. Right. And so we, now that our country and our world is on more of a, a, a this health trend now, Hopefully we can make it, you know, take it from a trend to, you know, a, a new lifestyle across the board, you know, to be able to provide a, a better quality life. And you can improve that quality by, by being more mindful of what you're consuming day in and day out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I'm wow. Loving, I'm loving it. So, so is, is that part of Rustic Nights? Because I, I, I did read that. Okay, so so what Rustic Nights is, so Rustic Nights is another way I'm using my farm in a non-traditional agricultural way. Okay. And so it doesn't, Rustic Nights is an event, it's for adults, uh, but it's an event. I have an event company called George Wilson Experiences. And so uh, with the pandemic and everything, I sit, I have a pond, I have a picnic pavilion by my pond and every day I work, um, I always sit at the pavilion and watch the sun set. Okay. And so that's just what my that's just what I do at the end of every day that I work at the farm. 
And so I was sitting out there one day and I was like, man, I got a nice setup that I think we may be able to do like an outdoor dinner party out here. You know, we've been cooped up as a country, you know, since February or March and people are itching to get outside and, and, and interact socially. I think that's the biggest loss that we've had is that social interaction, that connection to other people. And so I saw it as an opportunity to be able to, to connect people, to give people a safe environment, to be able to reconnect with people they haven't been able to see and talk to and interact with, you know, for, for some time. And so um, I found me a caterer, found me a couple uh, event decorators and uh, man, we got to work and, and we put together what we call rustic nights. Uh, it's at a part of my farm that we call Reesville. And Reesville is, um, it's been in my family since 1941. Wow. When my, when my great grandfather uh, bought the farm. So I'm a fourth generation steward of the property. I call myself a steward because I'm not an owner because I can't take it with me. Right. This is my, it's my opportunity to manage this and hopefully leave it in a, in, in a better place than I, than I found it in. And so right. Rustic Nights is a part of that growth. And so, you know, most traditional farmers, you're either doing livestock or agriculture, where my approach to the farm, I have 140 acres. I look at those acres as my blank canvas and I'm an artist and I got to paint my masterpiece. And so, you know, Rustic Nights is an effort to try to bring another audience that's not looking for produce. They're not looking, you know, for livestock. They're just looking for an experience. Wow. And so I'm not just trying to pigeonhole myself and limit myself to just being limited to agriculture and crops and livestock. I want to, you know, I'm a, I have a business degree. You know, I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. And so I'm trying to steer the farm in a different direction while still holding true to still being a farm at its core, but mm -hmm. not necessarily being limited to one or two streams of income that are more geared toward agriculture. Hosting events is not a part of agriculture, but I know that people like to be out on the farm. They like the fresh air. They like the scenery, right. you know? And so you you just, you know, I just try to, you know, uh, trying to build that experience. And, and Rustic Nights is, is for adults, but I got plans for kids. Uh, I used to do a leadership retreat in Nashville, Tennessee yeah, for about eight or nine years. I so I, I, I did that for eight or nine years. Yeah. And after looking at all the money that I spent throughout the years doing that, I said, I can invest the same money on my farm mm -hmm. and be able to service more kids more often because I was only doing it one time a year. And so okay. now I don't have to just limit myself to serving 50 or 60 kids once a year. I can do that every weekend or I can do that every month if that's what we want to do. Right. And so not only, you know, do, do you know, can I do it? But also I can, I can, uh, you know, expose that, you know, I offer that opportunity to other schools, mm -hmm. to churches, to businesses for team building and leadership development opportunities and things like that. And so these are the type of things that I'm trying to create uh, on my farm property to drive a different demographic, a different audience to my farm. And so wow. they may come, they may come for an event like rustic nights but then eventually they may see oh he got a campground over here with outdoor activities you know we make and use that for for our church camp this summer or yeah, hey he cool. got he got this event shit. venue over here man we maybe can do our family reunion out here or maybe i can get married out here and so these are the mm -hmm. things i'm just trying to i'm just trying to come up with these different gifts that i was i refer to them because the name of my farm is called phonograph farms okay Phonograph Farms, I got that name because I, growing up in school and playing sports, I always felt that I was different from my peers because of my upbringing and my exposure to farm life. And so I've always referred to those childhood experiences on the farm as dividends. Those are things that keep on giving, keep paying you over and over again. And so I always have referred to the farm as the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. So when I purchased the farm, I researched the origin of that slogan. And upon, upon my, my research, I found out that the gift that keeps on giving was the slogan that was used for the very first phonograph that was ever bought to market. Wow. And so everything that I'm doing at the farm, I refer to as a gift. 
And if I keep creating all these gifts, it'll eventually turn into a gift that keeps on giving, but not to me, but to my community. And to wow. the people I'm trying to serve. And so that's the vision of the farm. That's the origin of the farm name. And what I've laid out to you guys is the direction that I'm trying to take the farm in. Okay. That is amazing. I'm a gardener, not a farmer, but I'm a gardener. And I like you. I uh, learned being from Chicago, there, there's nothing but concrete in the buildings. So I came to North Carolina and learned about agriculture. This is an agriculture state. Absolutely. And, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and in doing that, um, I started a garden several, several, several years ago because I started juicing. And, and, and really, that's how that started. I was juicing, it's a model, you need to juice because right. it's better for you. You still don't have to start. Okay, so all right. so right. I go to the store and I'm going to get all this stuff for the juice, but the, the juice was expensive out the store. Right. And in conversation with somebody, it's like, you know, cucumbers grow real good here. You juice a lot of those. Da, da, da. So one thing led to another, and it's been probably 10, 15, maybe 12 years later, I'm still gardening. Um, and I learned so much about God's ecosystem, as I call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, the, the spider web catches the mosquito and, and the worm has its role and That's everybody's true. got their thing to do because they make irrigation holes. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. Absolutely. And the owl is up there watching me and the, you know, I mean the frog and the snake, it's all these indications. And I learned I that I enjoy dirt. I learned, <laughs> I, enjoy, I like the smell of certain dirt. I'm just, a, you know, I, I can sit outside and, 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 and sit out in the dirt all day long and just oh, yeah. hat on and do my thing. <laughs> and that's and that's also my workout too, so. Uh-huh, oh yeah. I'm oh, killing yeah. the first one stone then I get to choose that. Absolutely, a, a lot of people are not even aware that working, you know, in the dirt, putting your hands in the dirt actually boosts your immune system because you expose your body, you expose your body to the, the bacterias that are, you know, the good bacterias that are in the soil and everything. And so it actually helps to, to boost your immune system as well, so like, and these are all things just like you that I had to learn by actually immersing myself, you know, in, in, in the gardening. And so, you know, it just, it, you, you learn something new every day. Every day is not the same thing, you know, and, and, and that's what I, that's what I, I find joy in, you know, with being at the farm. Yeah, uh, amazing. It's been absolutely a pleasure talking to you. We're well over our time as always, but it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I got a word uh, from someone earlier that knows you, and, and, and she said he is a beautiful man inside and out. And that was Crystal Coney. Oh, man, yeah, Crystal, like good people. Good people, man. Yeah, great people, you know. I've been knowing Crystal yeah very long time and she actually saw where we were going you were going to be on the show yeah she got and nc roots too so yeah yeah does. absolutely and she That's is a beautiful Carolina. person inside and out as well and i told her um that i would definitely say hello for her so she says hello georgia all right please, please tell well, us george, hello. in our in our closing how can our people uh stay connected with you yeah uh you can you can find me on, on facebook under george wilson uh, you can find me on Instagram at GW, the cultivator. Uh, you can find me on Twitter under the same moniker. Um, you know, I, I got, uh, you can follow me on my, my company page on, uh, for GW, George Wilson experiences on Instagram as well. Um, and if you find me on one of those, man, you can always keep track of what I got going on my personal life at the farm. And also, you know, uh, in, in my, in my business, uh, with my business world uh, as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, you are you are a pleasure to have as a guest, a pleasure to have as talent at Maryland's agency. Um, and uh, we expect to see many great things come from George Wilson. That's right. Well, I, I appreciate you guys business. having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, share my story. Uh, hopefully somebody will, will gain some uh, some inspiration to be able to pursue you know, their goals and dreams and aspirations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I just thank you guys for the opportunity, man. We, oh, we need, definitely. we need, we need more of this, you know, to be able to have this dialogue yeah. for, 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 for our people to be able to, to see us, uh, you know, coming together to amplify our voices, to be able to bring hope uh, to our communities. Absolutely. Right. And as this matter matters, uh, we are growing. So we are moving to a YouTube channel. So we want to make sure. Congrats. Congrats on that. Congrats. <laughs> we, we, have, we have persevered, haven't we, we Travis? I, I say right. every great show 
uh, every great show that we have, we have some, some fabulous shows. Every, every show is fabulous. But every phenomenal show, you know, there's always those ones that stick out like this one right. and, and, and a few others that we have had. There's always torrential rain and there's always technical difficulty. We That's right. <laughs> We can count on some technical difficulties. And, and, and hey, listen, this goes without saying, tonight is no different. Yeah. <laughs> I am over here working. Y'all don't even know. Yes. I'm like typing all over. I got screens going everywhere. People yes. are sending me messages, blowing me up. And I'm just like, I can't. I got a deal. I got to right. so, We got to yeah. press on because this is like, this is a valuable, this is a valuable community that we have started. And we want you to remain a part of this community with this matter matters as well, because what we do is significant. We don't want our um, voices to be a moment. We are looking for this to be a movement in, Absolutely. Uh, in our future for our children. And we hope that at some point, those people that have in their hearts ill will will begin to um, melt that down a little bit. You know, just, just, just as you listen, as you begin to connect, because connection is key. And I think many people that have these thoughts and, 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 and in this industry, I have experienced it. I know that Travis has experienced it. We, 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 we understand that there are prejudices that uh, befall us within in, um, entertainment, uh, acting roles. People are very, very clear in many cases of who they want and why they want them. And Absolutely. So that being said, we hope that this uh, broadens uh, the heart and the mind of many people that we know take issue with certain things. We've had, Travis and I both, you know, some, some people in the industry have made their voices very clear to us about how they feel right. regarding certain of these cases that have uh, uh, reached national plateaus in ways that we should... We don't want to have to discuss, but we have to. But there are those people that feel like, well, if he or she had not been doing this or that, this right. would not have happened. Right. And so, you know, rather than um, be angry, we uh, have been afforded an opportunity, which is disguised as a whole lot of work. Right. <laughs> it's a lot Absolutely. Of work. Work. Absolutely. Work. But Maryland has afforded us an opportunity to uh, share a platform where we can begin to penetrate even just one heart of a person. Um, yeah, just one. If, if that if that's what we do and that's all we reach, then we're fine with that as well. Uh, but we intend, our intention is to get way out there and broaden, go, go way deep out into the hearts of many, many people. And so with that being said, I'd like to say publicly for the people of Louisville, I know that they are angry. I know the people I've worked in Kentucky. I've got a lot of friends in Louisville. Yes. I've got a lot of friends uh, that I've worked with in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I just will say that I know the people are very, very angry, but I sure don't want to see them out on the street doing anything that's going to cause them to be killed. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this point, we have to be strategic with our responses. Uh, we see how the the president is using uh, these protests, uh, at least the violent portions that come after the peaceful protesters go home. Um, you know, they are essentially using them as ads to promote, um, you know, his brand as being the solution to what's going on. And so we have to be strategic in how we react and how we respond. And we don't want to give them the ammunition to keep us in this current state of affairs. We have to to be mindful of that and, and not assist them in, 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 in continuing um, this thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well said. Well said, George Wilson. Look, <laughs> that, that little cute face is down there. Tell him I said hello. Well said. That's right. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, he, hey, he, he, hey. this my son. He, he couldn't help himself. He, he, he looking for the camera. So, oh, I, I, all right, right. Now, go, go four, back in there. You ain't got no shirt on, bro. <laughs> oh, what, <the> <laughs> <laughs> right. what you gonna always know is they go. They, they never gonna have a shirt on. Listen. <laughs> I've had four of them and they've all been the same. They've grown oh, yeah. up one, but I have always looked in my back seat driving down the highway and where is your clothes at? Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that is, but hey, boys will be boys. Like boys will be boys. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Are you gonna do? I love it. I love it. So anyway, yeah. thank you so much. Join us again, please. We get absolutely I, I appreciate it. Would, would love to come back, man. I, I thoroughly enjoyed tonight's conversation. We'd like to have you, man, and uh, I can't wait to see you on set.
All right, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, we got to meet in person sometime soon, man. I have to make a trip up to North Carolina when, when things uh, are safe for us to be able to move around a little bit more. Let's absolutely. make it work. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining This Matter Matters with Travis and myself, Tasha Dukes, and the George Wilson. George Wilson. George hey, thank Wilson. you, guys. Take care. Until next time. All right.